Tonight we are here to discuss the sensational novel Exit West, now in paperback, and one of my favorite books of 2017. Shortlisted for the Man Booker and the Kirkus Prize, it also graced the top 10 lists of most major reviews. Exit West is at its heart a love story of a young couple, Saeed and Nadia, uh, seen through the prism of international migration and the trials of refugees from the Middle East to the West. What does it take to leave the country you call home and to place your new home in another person? The author Viet Thanh Nguyen, in his review in the New York Times, said that Mohsen Hamid is a graceful writer who does not shy away from contentious politics and urgent worldly matters. He exploits fiction's capacity to elicit empathy and identification to imagine a better world. Uh, he will be joined in conversation tonight by the journalist Steve Inskeep, the host of NPR's Morning Edition, the podcast Up First, and the author of the 20, 2011 uh, book Instant City, Life and Death in Karachi. So please join me in, me in welcoming Mohsen Hamid and Steve Inskeep to Sidwell Friends. Thank you, good evening. Uh, I'm the one who's named Steve, by the way, just so you know. Uh, it's an honor to be here with Mohsen Hamid, who is really one of the significant writers of our time. I don't want to embarrass you, Mohsen. Uh, but he's one of a handful, I think a large handful, of writers who have emerged from a somewhat troubled country. I talk here not of the United States, but of Pakistan, although <laughs> you have close, close connections to both. Um, and have written fiction that is really profoundly topical and in the news, but I feel like in a long-term way. And Exit West, uh, the book that we're going to discuss, among other things this evening, is certainly such a book. Um, I was rereading it just today, and uh, it's great to look at it a second time. I hope you've had an I hope you will have an opportunity after picking up a copy, uh, a copy this evening. But you've just come back to the United States, where you've lived for off and on for many years, and you've been looking around. What do you think when you uh, <laughs> turn on the news, check the internet, whatever you're doing to figure out what's happening in the United States, Mosin? Um, it's, uh, first of all, Steve, thank you for, for uh, being in conversation with me uh, this evening, and thank you all for coming out uh, tonight. Um, it's a bit of a strange time in America, it feels like. Um, I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, I had, yes. Yeah, there's, there's um, uh, I'm in a different city every day these days, and I turn on the hotel television and turn on the news channels. Um, and the de degree to which sort of you know, one person um, is dominating the conversation is, uh, is incredible. Um, I've never seen America, uh, or felt America, seeming this perplexed and this sort of uncertain of what will happen. Um, it's, it's as though all things are suddenly possible. I mean, you know, a porn star, for example, could suddenly appear and uh, involve the president in you know, legal wranglings. Anything could happen. Anything could happen, and the dominance of Trump in the news is pretty remarkable. Yeah. I've noticed on social media, people don't feel the need even, and actually in conversation, because occasionally we still do have conversations in this country. Um, people don't feel the need to even name him, do they? They can just say, he's done it again. Mm, yeah. Look what he's done. Yeah. Look what's happening there with him. Uh, you know, the name doesn't even need to be spoken. I can't recall anything like it. No, I, I, I think, I mean, I wonder what China was like in the, in the Cultural Revolution, but I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that Mao got more airplay than, uh, than Trump does. But, but I think another thing which is happening simultaneously is you're seeing this, um, this I'm noticing on this particular trip, uh, this reaction against, you know, Facebook. Um, and that is also very interesting because, of course, the two things are, are connected. Um, you know, the kind of conversation, the news media, the way in which information is being uh, prioritized, dealt with, etc., um, in the United States has changed enormously in the last decade or so due to things like Facebook. Um, and so uh, this other story which seems to be happening, which is um, a kind of 
it seems, very overdue reckoning with what Facebook and with what um, many technology companies are doing to society is happening, which is interesting to me. I should mention we are sneakily working around to one of the themes of the book, uh, because communication and the way that the globe is connected is certainly one of the themes that you will find in Exit West. But let me ask you about that, uh, because you've looked at this from many different angles. Just on the way uh, over here, uh, I saw a news item stating that Facebook has acknowledged they need to do something and they're trying to figure out what it is to ensure election security in 2018. Can they at all? Or is that really something that's in our own minds? We're going to have to be a lot, a lot smarter about what we read, what we consume, and how much we think about it. I think that, um, to me, the notion that a private entity can own uh, this information about us um, is, is a notion that needs to be reevaluated. Um, I mean, if you look at the United States, when you liberalize the news media, for example, um, and you open it up to private competition and all, everybody's sort of competing, what winds up happening is uh, it becomes a business to get attention. And what gets attention because of the way human beings are designed is things that frighten you. Uh, you pay much more attention to a threat than you do to something which is positive. So uh, a news headline about Pakistan is highly unlikely to read that today in Pakistan, 16,322,000 parents put their kids to bed, um, or you know, 816,000 people kiss their you know, boyfriend or girlfriend for the first time. Although those things are happening. It'll be that you know, there's a uh, Taliban or terrorist kind of a plot. And so what's happened is that in the United States, uh, and in many countries around the world, but particularly here, um, in the attempt to get people's attention, people have been frightened, sort of witless. Uh, people are terrified. And, um, and, and that uh, environment is very corrosive, I think, for democracy and for society. And is I think part of that what's driving the attention toward Donald Trump? He scares a lot of people, and so people are making a lot of money scaring us about it. Uh, well, even more than perhaps he has earned. Yeah, because um, uh, you know it's it's as though this hurricane is bearing down on you, right? And you just you can't sort of stop paying attention to this hurricane bearing down on you, except that this hurricane uh, has been bearing down for a while and is likely to keep bearing down for at least uh, three years. Um, but it's just there. It's a sense of. Um, uh, uh, menace uh, that's felt by many Americans or by those who support Trump, the menace of what will happen to uh, him, the forces, the shadowy forces against him. But all in all, I think what it's done is it has completely distracted people in really dangerous ways. Is President Trump big news in Pakistan? He's, um, you know, he's news. I think Pakistan sort of pioneered the uh, corrupt, uh, you know, self-dealing, uh, clearly uh, unfit for office uh, leadership model, you know, way before the United States. And so in that sense, um, you know, uh, nice that you guys have caught up, but uh, uh, I sometimes do think that Pakistan's at the cutting edge of global politics because, you know, Pakistan sort of pioneered in the 80s this Islamization, sort of a religious chauvinistic approach to how you think about your citizenship and your society, which now India, for example, is, is, is uh, desperately trying to catch up uh, on, and, and not just India, but Turkey and, you know, Russia. Um, so in many ways, you know, Pakistan is, is uh, ahead of the curve. But people in Pakistan, I think, are much more interested these days in China. Uh, America is of interest almost only as a threat. Um, you know, will Trump do something uh, you know, violent or crazy or dangerous? Um, but beyond that, as far as the opportunity is concerned, or where the world is headed, there's an incredible fixation on China. And I think this is not just in Pakistan, but it's happening all over uh, Asia. What do you Africa. mean by fixation? Well, um, do people I mean, want to be China? Do they want to get money from China? What do they want? I think that um, people imagine <coughs> that, um, that, uh, that there's this giant country which used to be poor, which is now becoming increasingly less poor, middle class, um, and which seems to be intent on coming to other countries. 
and engaging with them and perhaps creating a possibility that they could also follow on this path. And um, uh, I don't think people want to be China necessarily, but, but the notion is that, you know, that there is a model that allows a country to, um, to progress in this way is, is, is very attractive because um, you know, for a long time there were, there were people like me who are sort of hybrids between the South and the West, you know, that we uh, have uh, origins in one place and we're educated you know, in America or Britain or whatever. And, and, you know, we have gone back to countries like Pakistan and very often become the elite of these countries. And, um, uh, and while we have values of equality and tolerance and rule of law, etc., generally speaking, we've set up governments that um, behave like uh, colonizing powers, right? That, that, that keep the vast majority of people incredibly poor um, while saying the right kind of things and enriching ourselves. Um, so the kind of idealistic, individualistic model of the West is somewhat, you know, uh, less attractive right now. And China, and then you have the kind of um, idealistic communal model of, of the Islamists. Um, but unfortunately for them, uh, there's no clear idea of how anybody will get a job out of this. Um, you know, it would be nice to go back to the 8th century, but, you know, uh, how many, you know, Maybe not nice for everybody. Yeah, I mean, how many you know how many uh, oxen trainers do you really need? And and so and so the Chinese model, I think, which is which is um, in fact pragmatic and communal. Now, it's not idealistic, so it's not like the Islamists or like the Western model supposedly was, um, and it's not individualistic like the Western one. Is very appealing that there's something that allows us as a group of people to get better, but it's also pragmatic. So let me ask you about that, because when I talk with Americans in the military or USAID, people who think about foreign policy and think about the world and have some contact with the world, uh, they will commonly make a statement like this. I wonder if you think it's true. They will say, uh, yes, China is on the move. Yes, China has opened its first overseas military base in Djibouti on the shores of East Africa. Yes, China has all these ambitions, this Belt and Road project to connect all sorts of countries to China. Yes, China's investing in Africa. But, the Americans will say, uh, people don't actually want to be China. They don't actually want to have an authoritarian system. We're still better because we've got more freedom and we do more uh, kinds of foreign aid and we're still a much more attractive partner for countries around the world than China. Do you think? That is actually what people in the developing world are thinking? Well, until the more attractive partner uh, part, I think there, there is a lot of that. You know, many more people would like to go live in America, I think, than they would like to live in China, at least now. Um, and uh, although that attractiveness is diminishing, but it's still, you know, it's still there. Um, uh, the, the line of people at the U.S. Embassy trying to get green cards or visas is always going to be long. Or, or at least, you know, hopefully will be long for a while. But, um, uh, but the idea of being a better partner is, in fact, now very much in doubt. Because Pakistan, for example, has been a partner of the United States many times since independence, disastrously. And that disastrousness is partly because of completely idiotic policies pursued by the Pakistani uh, state, um, but partly because of uh, rather idiotic and short-lived policies pursued by the United States. And I think many countries have had that experience. And so the question is, well, there's a new game in town. Let's see how that works. And um, in Pakistan, for example, now if you go to a shopping mall, you see Chinese people. Um, uh, there is uh, enormous investment taking place. There is, you know, their power plants are being built, roads are being built. Um, there's talk of a Chinese university in Islamabad and uh, an architect friend of mine was telling me about this and I said, oh, so Pakistanis will learn Chinese? And he said, no, um, in 20 or 30 years there might be a million or two million Chinese living in Pakistan, the Chinese diaspora in Pakistan, and this university will be at least partly, it will be open to Pakistanis, but for their kids to make it more attractive for Chinese people to settle in Pakistan. And that, you know, is the kind of thing that America once might have done but certainly doesn't seem to be doing anymore. Uh, so what do Pakistanis think about that? Because you just described, it sounds like Pakistan's going to be colonized. Well, I mean, I think the idea is, you know, um, there's like, 
colonized, and colonized are two very different things, right? So we use coloni colonizing as a metaphor, you know, that, oh, you've been colonized, you know, it's culturally colonized. But colonization was something different. You know, colonization was people from one place coming to another place, subjecting all of those people, taking control of the place, having a military that ruled that place, and basically not having exactly slaves, but certainly serfs of that population. And China is not doing that, right? China is doing sort of hard-nosed business and wheeler dealing, you know, wheeler dealing, and um, et cetera. So, so I think that, I think that um, uh, uh, it isn't exactly colonization. Um, but also, uh, uh, it, 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 it's unclear really what's going to happen. Um, but but what, one thing which is happening is that uh, you know, there, there really are two continents on planet Earth. There's this sort of Euro-Afro-Asia, which is sort of somehow divided into these three continents. But Europe really is a subcontinent of Eurasia, just like the Indian and Pakistani subcontinent is. Um, and Africa is attached to the same thing. And that's where, you know, 80, 90% of the world's people live. And that place is knitting itself together. It's building roads and highways and ports, and it's becoming more cohesive and connected to itself. And then there's the continent of the Americas, um, which is actually a fairly you know, small part of the human population, 10, 20%. And, um, and the idea that the rest of it will get closer and closer together, I think, is likely. Um, and, uh, uh, and China's, I think, driving that. But I think there's a lot of appetite among many people to see something like that happen. So the book is called Exit West. Um, would you just describe what it's about? Simple love story, young man, young woman, meet in an unnamed place. What's it about? So Exit West is, is in a sense, uh, a breakup story. Um, and it's a story of, of many different breakups. Um, this young couple that has to leave the city where they live because of uh, violent conflict, uh, a sort of geographic breakup. Um, the breakup of a family, uh, Said in particular, is very close to his parents. Nadia uh, uh, is less so. Um, Said has to leave his family behind. Nadia does the same. Um, and also, in a sense, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what we call a story about a first love. And we say first love because presumably um, there was a second love and a third love. Otherwise, we just say it's a story about a love. Um, so first love is poignant because something else happened afterwards. Uh, and this, is, this novel is a story of a first love. And, and it is, I guess, uh, as Seyd and Nadia leave their home uh, city unnamed and move first to Greece and then to London and then to New York by means of these sort of black doors, which I'm sure we'll talk about, um, the whole world begins to change around them. I want to talk about the black doors because I think that relates uh, to a lot of the things that we've just been discussing. There's a scene very early on when you flash from whatever this unnamed city is to Australia, I think, and a woman is sleeping in her bedroom and remains asleep throughout the scene. Suddenly someone appears in a closet door, apparently from another place, and heads out of the room, and then this happens again and again. What's going on? So um, the novel obeys uh, the rules of physics as we you know, generally understand them, uh, with one a very small uh, exception, which is that uh, uh, doors all over the world um, are beginning to change. And so your apartment or house in DC, um, you know, one day the door to your bathroom may no longer be a door to your bathroom, but a kind of black, opaque rectangle. And if you push yourself into this black opaque rectangle, you find yourself emerging, not in your bathroom, but in Tokyo or Kinshasa or Sao Paulo. And, um, and as these portals begin to appear, people start to go through them and billions of people move. And um, in a way, for me, uh, uh, I think these doors sort of exist um, in the sense that we each carry with us a little black rectangle, you know, our phones and our pockets or our purses or backpacks, and, and if when we, these black rectangles that we carry, when we look at them, you and I could be speaking right now over Skype and we'd see each other if I was in Pakistan and you were in DC, um, and it would be as though we were you know, in close proximity. But if I missed my flight today, that's what I would be exactly. doing. With, with your going. family, yeah. I know. Um, but uh, the thing about it is that um, these black rectangles that we carry um, allow our consciousness 
to um, depart from the physical location of our body. And we can instantaneously be reading about Pakistan or Djibouti or China um, or the surface of the moon or colonization of Mars or the history of Westeros. And, um, and, and, uh, and so I thought, you know, if we can already move our consciousness through these doors anywhere and we're addicted to them and we can keep doing this, in fact, oftentimes we're more away from our body than actually where our body is. Yeah. What if our bodies could move in the same way? Um, because I think technology is obliterating physical distance. And so, and so these doors were born out of that kind of notion. So if you have this door and people from other countries can suddenly appear in front of you, um, can you build a wall <laughs> in front of the door? Well, I think, um, you, you know, you, you can. Um, the problem is that uh, every door conceivably could become a door like this. So you'd really need to wall up all your doors, um, which would be difficult because then you wouldn't be able to get to any rooms. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, the, the, the problem with walls, of course, is that, is that no wall structure cannot have a door. I mean, I suppose it could, uh, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a trap for the people inside it at that point. Um, but, but attempts to, in a sense, wall off these doors do take place in the novel. So say that now they arrive in London, and there the, the nativists, uh, people who are frightened, you know, by the arrival of so many migrants all of a sudden in London, um, uh, there's, a, there's a feeling that, 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 you know, that they need to be contained and corralled in certain neighborhoods and that will there be an attempt to you know, put them into concentration camps or to exterminate them. Um, and in the novel, in a sense, that, that desire um, uh, that humanity turns away from that uh, because um, the degree of violence that we're going to have to inflict upon each other to really maintain these kind of separations and man these walls um, is quite horrific. You know, we're already seeing the beginnings in the United States, but you see it in Europe as well, where, okay, first let's say you build a wall, fair enough. Um, but then there'll be people who still get through. You have to find them. Um, and then when you go to pick up those people, you'll need a kind of Gestapo-like force that does this. And, and then uh, some people who are, uh, have been in the country through their ancestors for generations will help those who've come across. And the Gestapo force will have to pick up the local collaborators with the migrants. And then the friends and family of the local collaborators will have to be picked up because they will try to stop the Gestapo from picking up their sons and mothers and brothers and sisters. And, you know, the, the, the direction from here to a totalitarian police state is clear. The people generally, you know, notwithstanding uh, China's relative appeal, most people don't want to uh, move into or move their societies into totalitarian police states. And I think um, once the implications are, are more felt, the kind of society you're going to have to be, a society of complete government surveillance, a society with a secret police, a society where people are being picked up and, um, and imprisoned, uh, where you know, freedom is a completely uh, lost notion uh, and a kind of apartheid rules, um, I suspect that for most people that just will not be desirable and they will resign themselves to, I think, the alternative. Is the technology that we discussed at the beginning, Facebook and other things, and the connectivity that you're describing and that you, uh, that you allude to in this novel, that you illustrate really in this novel, is that part of the reason that this feels like such a divisive moment? Is it simply that we are much more easily in contact with people who are different from ourselves? I think we, we are more easily in contact, but I think that, that that isn't necessarily why this is happening. I think we're more frightened. Um, what has happened is that, uh, you know, Homo sapiens evolved to treat negative information much more strongly than positive information. So, you know, our ancestors who saw a flash of orange, you know, in the, in the jungle and said, it's probably not a tiger, got eaten. And the ones who said, that might be a tiger, run, survived. And we've inherited their DNA. And so when we see things that are potentially dangerous, we get freaked out, as we should, and we run. But we didn't see tigers very often. But now, thanks to our phones and Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, we are continuously receiving frightening bits of information. We are, we are spending our entire time in a sense of uh, 
anxiety and fear and, and almost physical threat. And that means that we sort of miscalibrate what's going on. Because actually on planet Earth, what's going on is that the poorest people on planet Earth have more calories to eat today than they did 50 years ago. Um, the gap between girl and boys' education on planet Earth is getting smaller. Um, you know, people are living longer. The percent of the population which is being killed, human population, in war and violence is going down. Um, but yet all of those things seem impossible because the view we have of the world is this terrifying view of everything getting worse. And if everything feels like it's getting worse, what begins to become very attractive is the past. We start to become in love with what was. Or uh, what we imagined exactly, was. Exactly, what we imagined was. And so then that enables a kind of nostalgic politics. You know, the make Islam great again. Um, uh, politics of like ISIS or, you know, Al-Qaeda um, and its various permutations that we see all around the world. Uh, you spent some time in the book describing the character's phone habits. Uh, Said, well, Said, am I saying his name yeah, correctly? Said, yeah, Said, yeah. Um, Said tries to limit his phone use at one point, which makes me wonder, do you try to limit yours? Yeah. How? I mean, I think that, I think that we, um, you know, it does not make sense for us to each as individuals allow our relationship to technology to be architected and defined by a bunch of dudes sitting in Silicon Valley who are, who are maybe are very different from us. Um, I, and, and, you know, they're 90% dudes, maybe more than that. And um, I think that uh, uh, we need to each actively shape how we are going to relate to technology going forward. Ideally, we would, with the help of our government, um, but in the countries where our governments seem entirely captured uh, by business interests, that means just as individuals. And, um, and for me, what that means is, you know, um, disabling uh, my web browser on my phone. Um, uh, you did that? Yeah, uh, disabling my, um, my email uh, on my phone. Meaning I have to go to my computer to check my email. I have to go to my... And I, and I, and I do this because I get completely addicted to my phone otherwise. You know, I'm not on social media. I, um, uh, I avoid these things because, uh, you know, I, I um, have had, uh, you know, a very close friend who was a heroin addict. And, you know, when I see what happens to my children when I try to take away their iPod, iPod or iPad or whatever device, um, uh, which they get for one day a week, uh, um, I recognize this, you know, it's, it, it's an addiction. Um, the behavior, the, the degree of passion, the trauma, the, the craving that they're having is so strong. So, Do they sneak uh, around you? To I mean, it, they're quite week? small, but I think that, you know, the time when... The Mine time, are also, but, yeah, you know... I mean, uh, luckily they are unarmed and they are, you know... Uh, <laughs> short, uh, but, but, you know, I, I think they will soon hold my wife hostage uh, to get the keys or, 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 you know, climb up there and, and break the lock. If they could, they would. Um, and so I, I think in a sense what's important is, um, you know, we are rushing towards a future where human beings and our technology are integrating and, and humanity and machines are kind of merging. But we are doing this with so little conversation about what form it should take or whether we want it to be this way or how quickly it should happen, etc. cetera. And, uh, and, but for me, in a sense, the one thing about this is that it should give us all enormous hope is, uh, you know, human beings so often define the group they belong to in relationship to this other, right? So if you're, a, you know, uh, in Pakistan, you're a Punjabi or you're a Sindhi or in America, you know, you, you think of yourself as, as white or black or Asian or whatever. Um, we very often have these kind of groups that we, that we use to establish identity. Um, uh, but I think we are on the cusp of actually um, perhaps being able to think of human beings as our group. Because we are giving birth to um, machines that can think and learn. And, and very soon uh, they will be capable of doing many things better than we can. And so the question of, you know, what is the biggest threat to us or what do we need to as a species or group think of and manage is likely not to be, you know, what is North Korea up to or what is sort of China up to or what is India in the case of Pakistan up to, but collectively, what are machines that can learn up to and how are we going to regulate and manage this? And I think, you know, humanity is going to start thinking of itself as human, I suspect, in the next century because something else is going to appear that isn't 
that's incredibly capable. And we would define ourselves as not the machines. Yeah, and I think that'll be actually the, the, the chance to really change our politics, you know, to think about migration differently, to think about uh, global warming differently, to think about um, all of these things expand. Because when you start thinking of yourself as human, then you can think of human level solutions as opposed to the you know, completely uh, insufficient um, you know, national or ethnic level solutions that we seem to be able to Did you? Right I know you've been talking about this book some in the past. Uh, have you had an opportunity to say these things in or around Silicon Valley? You know, um, uh, I'm, I'm headed out to uh, San Francisco shortly. Um, uh, I think that, I mean, in Silicon Valley, there, there's, there's a meeting of two different trends. And I, I can say this because I was a kid from Silicon Valley. I lived in Silicon Valley from 1974 to 1980, and my mother worked in, a, I guess you could say, an early technology company, uh, making this uh, high-tech uh, thing that was called a uh, cassette. And it was like a piece of, you know, it had this sort of uh, tape on which magnetic signals could be stored. Um, and, uh, and was it like wound up? Like it was like wound. Toilet paper? Uh, it, exactly. Okay. It was like toilet paper. All right. um, and, uh, and you could put music on it and you could put computer programs on it. And, um, and there it was in California being made. My mother was, had, a, had a junior level job at the accounting department of this firm. My dad was doing his PhD at Stanford. So I lived there, 1974 to 1980. Um, I think what has happened is the incredibly optimistic, um, you know, iconoclastic, revolutionary, uh, and also engineering and pragmatic culture of that environment encountered insane amounts of money. Um, and in that process uh, became uh, very deeply corrupted so that uh, it was no longer possible for many people to understand that when they speak of making the world a better place and are actually making the world a much worse place, that this is going on, that your market valuation and market cap cannot be the definition of you know, where technology should go. So I think in that sense, when I go back now, the place is, you know, it's sort of, uh, I guess, uh, the love child between you know, the old um, Silicon Valley that I grew up running barefoot in, um, and, uh, you know, and, and a kind of Wall Street uh, uh, financial culture, um, which is clearly not sustainable. So, I mean, uh, I think, yeah, I'll certainly talk about it, but I, I think that all around the world people are talking about it, and you're seeing the backlash beginning, and um, it, is, it is increasingly clear that this is not a way for us to answer these questions, that, you know, what should happen with intelligent machines? Well, we should just let the Chinese and American militaries keep advancing them to the point where, you know, enormous numbers of people can be killed by uh, AI-based systems, and that we think this is a good idea. It seems, it seems to me insane. One other thing, and I'm going to turn it over to your questions here in a moment or two, uh, but I'm curious because you wrote this novel in which people are, without passing any border, without passing any checkpoint, moving from country to country around the world, um, which we're nowhere close to today. But uh, we used to be in, right? There were no passports until 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. People used to move this way. You used to become a citizen by showing up somewhere and saying you uh, were one. Yeah. Um, but we're in a different world now. Is it your view that that's the way the world should be? Yeah, I think, I think that the, the trend of human history is towards greater equality. And so, um, you know, uh, in this country, 150 years ago, um, uh, not far from where we're sitting right now, but only a few miles away, uh, uh, African-American people were slaves. Um, and now, uh, not far from here, we've had you know, an African-American president. Uh, women couldn't vote, you know, uh, a century ago. Um, and now, hopefully soon, we'll have a, a woman uh, president. Uh, gay and straight people were thought of as completely unequal, and that's diminishing, you know, religious and non-religious people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it seems to me now, if racial equality, gender equality, equality of sexual orientation, of, of belief system, and all that stuff is being acknowledged, um, it seems to me inevitable that, you know, the incredible inequality due to the lottery of the place on planet Earth you happen to be born is going to be questioned. Um, that, that at some point people are going to say, why should somebody born in Milwaukee and somebody born in Mogadishu, a child born in these two places, have fundamentally different rights as human beings? You know, why should one have to stay where they are and die in violent conflict and the other one, you know, 
And, and so I think that history suggests that in 100 or 200 years' time, our descendants will look back at us and think of us as, our, as barbaric when it came to people who wanted to move refugees, as we think that slave owners are uh, uh, today. In looking at your very efficient two-word book title, I found myself wanting to add a word or two, mm. and I wondered which words would be appropriate. Exit West. Do you mean exit to the West or exit of the West? Um, uh, you know, both, really. Um, uh, so the two characters do exit West. Um, and they exit west in the sense of they wind up eventually in Marin County in California, just above uh, San Francisco, in this giant shanty town that's grown up there. Um, a kind of favela, uh, which I'm sure would make the uh, property owners in Marin County today very happy. Um, but can't uh, wait for your Marin. County I know appearance. exactly. My Marin County appearance will be, you know, uh, will be sponsored by the local real estate uh, agency. But um, the the. Uh, so they, they, they do exit west in that sense. And of course, exit west is also this western metaphor, right? That, that you know, going to the west, you know, go west, young man or young woman. Um, and they are, in a sense, engaged in that pilgrimage, which is, in some senses, the pilgrimage that's not only west, but, you know, uh, for all of us, our mother continent is, uh, is Africa. Uh, all of our ancestors uh, originate in Africa. And even people who live in Africa today, in the Rift Valley, where Homo sapiens uh, evolved, um, they too are descended from migrants because their ancestors left the Rift Valley and moved around and eventually resettled. It's not like the people in the Rift Valley today are the people who have been there forever. Everyone started there, went somewhere else, some came back, some went to other places. Um, so, you know, this notion of exiting west or going to this other place has always been there. But the other meaning you mentioned, which is exit of the west, I think is already well underway um, because there is no west, actually. Uh, you know, the notion that of this West is kind of absurd, right? Because Morocco is further West than Italy, and, um, you, know, uh, you know, Peru is further West than, than New York. It is a round planet, yes. after all. And, and, you know, when you get to, and when you get to, you know, when you get to California, what's West? China and Japan are actually West of The it. East. Yes, west. exactly, the East. Um, and, and so, uh, in that sense, it's an absurdity. We mean something by the West which we have a difficult time articulating. The, you know, the prosperous countries of primarily European descent, which is a very clumsy sounding term. Um, but what's happening in these places is that, um, you know, people of the East or the South or the rest are coming and they are settling, as they always have. And, um, and they're bringing with them ways of thinking and being and looking. And people from the West and influenced by the West, of course, are also in the East and in the South. And so if someone like me lives in Lahore, you know, what is that? Am I a Western person in Lahore? Is Lahore still in the East? Is my house in the East or is it kind of in the West? And, and, and similarly, you know, my family, which makes up half of this room, uh, this audience tonight, uh, uh, I'm not kidding, actually, it, it, it is, you know. We're going to have you stand up in a moment. That's folks. right. Uh, uh, you know, who, who live here in D.C., um, you know, is that the East present here, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, the notion of a West uh, is itself exiting. You know, we can talk about democracy, rule of law, equality, even English. Um, but, uh, uh, but we, I think we need not speak of it as the West. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think we will probably be unable to do so for that much um, longer, that we'll need better words. Because already in America, what you see, for example, are, are clear divisions. Um, between the east and west of America and the middle of America, or actually more accurately between urban America and rural America. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think this notion of a west is going to go away. And, and, and I think it's good that it goes away because um, why do we need it exactly, right? We, we, we've had, um, in a sense, if we take you know, prosperous people of European descent as a kind of definition of, of who, what the west consists of, um, there was a period where uh, this group of people did have disproportionate prosperity and did colonize, you know, much of the world, etc. I think many of us would say, probably hopefully all of us would say, that it's good that that time is ended. 
Um, and, uh, and we needn't elevate one group of people above any other. Um, and so, you know, do we need this term, like West? Uh, and, you know, uh, similarly, you know, terms like, you know, white. Um, you know, do, we, do we need these kind of terms? What do they really mean? Uh, so, yeah, so I think that stuff is going to be good there. Let's have a round of applause for Mohsen Hamid here. And actually, who is, who is Mohsen's fam family? Will you stand up if you are related in some way to oh, Mohsen no. Hamid here? Poor guy, I think they none of them volunteered oh, for this. Oh, there's only one? Okay. No, no, there, there are more. There They're are, not doing there it? More. They're refusing? Yeah. No one wants to admit? They're, 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 one, yeah. okay, one, yeah. two, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, a bunch. Yeah. That's there great. We Welcome. See. Welcome. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Lily. She's going to guide your questions for Mosin Hub. Hi, uh, Matthew Sada. I had a question for you. You've written now four novels, and I'm curious as to when we can see the development of a real good villain. A villain? Wow. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting one. Uh, I guess um, in, in my novels, um, uh, the idea of the villain as a kind of external character, right? Something outside us is, um, isn't so present. I mean, there are, I guess, dangerous or menacing characters, but they're in passing. They aren't like, you know, the, they aren't Darth Vader uh, level characters. In, uh, but I, get, I suppose I'm more interested in, in the villainy within us, you know, and, um, uh, and, within me, the writer, but within the characters that I create, and also within the reader. Um, so, for example, if you look at The Reluctant Fundamentalist, The Reluctant Fundamentalist is a novel where uh, only half a story is told. A Pakistani character meets this, you know, presumably American, although we're not quite sure, he doesn't say anything that we can hear, character, and they have this strange interaction. Um, and the reader has to figure out what they make of this. And so the reader's own presuppositions or stereotypes or inclinations or ways of reading, uh, gut feelings, come into play. Uh, and, and, and the novel is a kind of mirror to that. It, it leaves the reader with an incomplete sense of, you know, what happened here? What did you do? Uh, uh, um, I, I, I suppose the villain that has always most interested me is the villain inside myself, uh, of which there is, you know, a fairly, uh, fairly robust one. And sort of, you know, chipping away at, at that is interesting. And, and I imagine that for many readers, um, it is the same, right? That, that we each contain this potential for villainy. And it's kind of worth examining that and, and trying to, as much as possible, diminish it um, instead of locating villainy outside ourselves. And, and in this novel, for example, um, Exit West, uh, the people who are frightened of the migrants are not portrayed as villains, right? They, they um, um, because I don't think they are. I think the fear that the migrant or refugee has of leaving their homeland and going to a new place, um, and the fear that somebody has of their country becoming a foreign country to them because new people are arriving, are actually the same fear. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's a fear of loss and a fear of, 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 of things changing and a fear of... Um, uh, of losing what it is that you most value. Uh, uh, and, and so for me, in a way, it's, it's more useful instead of trying to imagine one or the other of these parties, the nativist or the migrant is a, is a villain, um, to instead explore whether we aren't all refugees, actually, um, you know, from our childhoods, from, our, from the past. Um, each moment that we live in is lost to us forever. Uh, the people we knew when we were kids have passed away or moved on. Uh, uh, our countries change, our cities change. And so, um, in a sense, if we can begin to see in all of us um, an essential character as migrants and refugees, um, we can hopefully move on from this kind of opposition that we imagine that we're in to a more radical sense of humanity that we can all belong in together, uh, and which does involve a certain degree of fear of change. Um, but, but which that fear of change, in a sense, is best approached by us accepting that things are transient. Mm -hmm. Everything changes. You know, we lose everything in a human life. Being a human being means you will lose everything. 
And if that is the nature of what humanity is, then let's talk about what kind of lives we can live and societies we can build. Um, and we all fear this. So there's no reason to demonize us as racists or xenophobes, people who feel this too. Um, we can uh, perhaps together uh, accept this, talk about this, and find ways forward. So, um, so I don't know if we'll see exterior villains. I think, I think um, fighting our interior villains uh, is, is uh, enough of a challenge you know, for that. Yeah. Hi, um, this is Hina. Um, piggybacking on your thought about um, transient nature of uh, things. Um, one thing that I saw that was common between this um, Exit West and Reluctant Fundamentalist was the transient uh, nature of relationships, whether is it between Erika and Genghis or between Nadia and Said. Um, what I want to ask you is what draws you to explore this through your writing, um, especially when the, that transient nature is driven by our evolution as human beings, how our identities evolve over time. And in both the books, that was the common theme. So what draws you to it? You know, I think that um, maybe I have a slightly heightened you know, sense of the transient or um, feeling of... Uh, uh, something related to this. When I was three years old, we left, you know, um, uh, we left Pakistan for America. When I was nine, we left America for Pakistan. Um, and, and at the age of three, when I came, I didn't speak a word of English, but I did speak Urdu. And, um, and uh, uh, one day my mother saw me crying outside the door of the house where we lived. The next door neighbor, we had, were in identical townhouses on the Stanford campus, and she came out, and she saw that, you know, uh, I was looking up at a neighbor who was clearly not my mother, and the neighbor was looking down at this strange Pakistani kid, and I was surrounded by these other kids who looked like a kind of Benetton ad, or a, you know, little six-year-old or three-year-old United Nations um, from all over the world. And they said to my mother, you know, what's wrong with him? And I said, nothing. And she said, nothing. And they said, well, why can't he speak? And she said, he can speak. He just can't speak English. And after that, I didn't speak for a month, my parents tell me. And when I, I just sat on the TV and was silent, and they were very worried and concerned about me. And um, a month later, when I spoke, I spoke in English and complete sentences with an American accent. And, and nine years later, when I moved back to Pakistan, my parents discovered I'd completely forgotten Urdu. Um, and I had to relearn it from scratch. But when I moved to Pakistan in, at the age of nine, um, I never saw, heard from, or had any contact with any of my friends again, right? That's what happened in those days. There was no internet, phone calls were incredibly expensive. You know, who knew you lost mailing addresses, you couldn't look people up. That was it. So you left and you left. And so I suppose for me, the idea that, um, that relationships, you know, that this can happen in relationships, you can care about people, or even languages, places, and you lose them. Um, has been echoed subsequently in my life, as it is in all of our lives, by the people that we lose, the things that happen, the way that life changes. Um, and you're right, I think it is something that comes up again and again in my fiction. I, I think that it is actually a fundamentally human characteristic, and that the biggest, perhaps, in a sense for me, flaw in contemporary society is that we are being told that things can last, and that they can be permanent, and that this is simply not true. Um, and so, you know, we are no longer asking questions about how, does, how do things end well? You know, what is a good ending? And this novel, for example, is a novel about a relationship that, um, that doesn't end in a kind of battle between two people or devastation. Um, it explores the notion of a good ending. And I think that's very important because once upon a time in, in every culture, there was a notion, you know, uh, there were thoughts and culture on what constituted a good death. You know, it might be that, you know, to die well was to die surrounded by people you loved, um, you know, uh, mustering as much grace and strength as possible so that in your passing they were less frightened and less, you know, uh, saddened uh, in this moment. Um, and yet today we don't discuss this stuff at all, and so some young people think that a good death is to go into a shopping mall in Pakistan and blow up yourself with 50 strangers, or go into a school in America and shoot dead 50 other students and then kill yourself. Um, you know, this is the kind of perversity that can occur in a society, in societies, in a human civilization, um, where transience is no longer being addressed and thought of as central to human life. 
So, so, um, so I think in a sense, the, you could say the death is too strong, but the death of a kind of life that occurs with migration in childhood that I experienced um, has left me sort of really, uh, I guess, um, affected. And it's something that I, I continue to want to figure out because I, I, I continue to experience it. Yes. Hi, I'm Zainab. Um, first of all, congratulations on your Sitada Yamtiaz. <laughs> Thank which you. Is a, it's a, a Pakistani government, high honor from the Pakistani government, so well deserved. Thank you. Um, so you, you write a lot about, I know you draw from your own experience of moving to the uh, West, which you just eviscerated. But uh, so you, you um, a lot of your characters are moving. I also from, exited and moved back to the East, actually. So That's right. Yeah. So um, that's kind of <laughs> yeah, exactly. what my question is about. Do you see a lot of your characters are always moving from the um, so to speak, east to the west. Um, are there any sort of plots that you think about of people from the west moving to the east, not people like you or me who are from the east and came here and moved back, but people who are not from that region going there having some sort of culture shock or whatever? Thank you. I, I, I don't know where I'm from, to be very honest with you. Um, I've gotten a bit mixed up uh, along the way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly a, a mongrel. Uh, you know, am I a Western person, Eastern person? I have no idea. Um, uh, I think many people actually are mongrels. Uh, maybe all of us are mongrels in different ways. I think we are actually all mongrels. But, um, but the idea of, of char I mean, in The Reluctant Fundamentalist, which in a sense is a mirror book to this one, if, if this one is about exiting West, Reluctant Fundamentalist was about exiting East in a sense. But as you, you're asking about somebody who didn't grow up, for example, in the East, heading east. Um, uh, it might be something that I do write about um, uh, in the future, but I'll, I'll, but I'll tell you something which I've observed which is very interesting in, in, in Lahore, in Pakistan. Um, I was, you know, at the uh, Lahore Literary Festival a couple of months ago, and I ran into this young woman. And she was talking to my wife. And I had assumed, you know, she's a uh, British uh, woman, and um, uh, maybe in her mid-twenties. And I had assumed that she was a writer, you know, from England here for the festival, or perhaps a diplomat, or a, you know, an aid worker, or something. Um, uh, tourist. Uh, maybe she was married to a Pakistani. Um, and, but it, you know, it turned out she was an immigrant. Uh, she had come to Lahore for a job and she had studied sort of child development and then she graduated from university and I suppose had not found uh, good jobs in her field and she found a school system in Lahore that needed child development specialists so they could develop a special needs program in these schools and the job paid better and offered you know, more responsibility and a chance to affect more lives than anything she could find in the UK and she moved to Lahore for a job um, this is going to start happening a lot. Uh, you know, if you're a young architect from Italy, uh, you know, how many new buildings are being built in Italy? Uh, uh, but in Lahore, a city of 11 million, which will be a city of 30 million in 25 years' time, there are a lot of new buildings. If you're an editor, wants a job in New York, you know, um, uh, there aren't that many jobs. But in Pakistan, you know, there's such a need for that. Uh, my sister just finished her postdoc, uh, uh, just finished her PhD in London and moved back to teach in Pakistan, and she's doing a postdoc uh, in Lahore. And the salary she's getting for her, her postdoc in Lahore, it's, it's modest, but it's just as much as somebody who got a lectureship uh, in London might be getting, uh, or in the UK might be getting. So, you know, because there's such a need, there's, there's so many people who want to be professors in, in America and Britain, uh, and so few posts. And there are so, there's the need for so many people like that in Pakistan. So uh, I think, I mean, whether I'll write this novel or not, I don't know, but I think the thing you've touched upon, which is the massive migration of people, you know, east, um, is, is beginning to occur and is likely to get faster and faster. And it always has occurred. You know, you can go 100 miles from Lahore and dig in the ground and find coins with Alexander the Great's face on them. Because he came, right? And, um, 
you know, uh, in, in, in Spain, you know, they call uh, these things uh, pantalones and we call them patloon in Urdu, almost the same word, and there are many other words like this, because people used to come and go, and they will continue to do so. And I think, you know, that is what Homo sapiens does. Um, two questions. One, what do you make of the refugee versus economic migrant terminology? And the second question is on your doors. Uh, did you watch the movie Get Out? <laughs> I have seen Get Out, yeah. So the first time I saw Nadia and Said go through the door, um, I kind of thought about the sunken place. You know, like a big black void where you can actually get captured and disappear. Now, both of them emerged on the other side, bruised, tired, sweaty. But, you know, I also think about all the people who drown or get stuck in a camp at Cox's Bazaar or Papua New Guinea and die of waterborne diseases or are killed or sold into slavery or the sex trade, um, go to a sunken place and they never emerge. Did you consider addressing that or was that going to make things too, too much of a downer? Well, I mean, uh, the first half of the book is a pretty serious downer, I think. Um, the, the uh, you know, I guess, I guess on, on two points. Um, I personally don't think that there should be a standard that one needs to be a refugee to be allowed to move. Um, I think, I think that, uh, that, that, you know, that, um, that economic migrant for me is good enough. You know, if you're economic migrant, great. You should be able to migrate. That's my view. Obviously, not necessarily super widely shared in in wealthy uh, democracies in North America and Europe. But um, but that so so for me, the refugee thing. But refugee does mean something, right? Refugee is a legal term. Refugee means that the risk that somebody faces legally has met a threshold which obligates us to help this person, right? Um, if we cannot bring ourselves to treat economic migrants decently, which we should, we must at least allow the refugee safety, which we are failing to do. Um, and, and the consequence of that failure is the same as the failures when somebody is drowning in a swimming pool next to you. There's a legal expectation that you need to help that person without risking your own life, but you throw something or you call somebody who can help. If you simply stand there and watch that person drown, you have usually broken the law. Now, that law exists in part to protect the drowning person because it's, it's wrong that they should drown when they could be saved. But it exists equally to protect the person who watches the drowning person. Because if you let somebody drown and you watch them do so, your own humanity has been fundamentally compromised. The kind of person you are, the kind of society you live in will no longer be a society that can aspire to being just or equal or moral. Um, and so the refugee brings a kind of challenge, right? That if you don't let the refugee in, which legally you should, um, your society itself can no longer claim to stand for, for the values that you claim that it stands for. And then you can look to other values, the values of apartheid, for example, um, which can be the values that you can build your society on, but you can no longer claim uh, the hypocrisy of saying, I stand for equality and human dignity and law while this person dies. Uh, I think that's the challenge the refugee presents uh, societies with. And, and, uh, and, and, um, uh, and you're seeing it, right? Like the failure to allow the refugee to come is coupled with the rise of totalitarianism and, and you know, evil uh, at the political level in, in societies which are doing this. Um, uh, they are failing to live up to their own ideals and they are corrupting what they can be. Uh, uh, so, so, but the other part of it is, in this novel, why don't we see that? Why don't we see the people who are, you know, who are trying to cross the Mediterranean in a small leaky boat or crawl into the barbed wire in the desert? Um, uh, the doors eliminate that. Uh, the reason for that, uh, that we don't see that in the novel is because at the moment, what I think has happened is, um, the, the popular, uh, or the, or the common representation of the refugee in, uh, in media and in culture has become that journey. You know, the person trying to get out of their country and, and crossing the Mediterranean and then winding up in the camp, or the person trying to get into America, etc. And all the rest of us who have not participated in that journey can say, oh, well, I haven't done this. This is a fundamentally different type of person than me, because I haven't tried to cross the Mediterranean in a small rubber boat. That defines this human being. I'm not one of this type of human being. 
If you remove the journey, that perilous journey, which I agree is horrific and terrible, and, and you know, humanity as a whole is, 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 is failing barbarically uh, to, to prevent these journeys from being necessary and helping those on them. But if we remove that part of the journey, what's left? What's left is a person who's in a place and thinks of leaving, and a person in a new place trying to figure out what to do. And every single one of us have been in that position even if it was just leaving our parents' house to move out on our own. Um, and so what I was hoping to do, in a sense, by removing that part of the journey, was to remove the mechanism by which we refuse to see in the migrant and the refugee ourselves. Because what's left behind, if you take the journey out, is each of us. And, uh, and so it was not to minimize the importance of that journey, but to universalize the human being who's engaged on it who's currently being exoticized and other by focusing on that journey, which is, of course, only a small part of their lives. Otherwise, they are exactly us. In fact, they, are, they literally are us. Uh, so that was why I did it that way. We're going to take two more questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for your passionate defense of the right to move to safety and even for better uh, you know, prospects. So that's very reaffirming because I work with refugees. But the other thing to me is you've seen that there is, uh, migration is a fundamental human right and it is the great equalizer. But at what point do you draw the line between migration and colonization? Not that I'm saying that all migration is colonization. Thank you. I'm, I think that you see, um, uh, again, you know, what, what uh, colonization had tended to be some group with greater power came in and seized control of an area and then brought people you know, of their own group into that place. And um, uh, you know, colonization was an exercise of the powerful upon the less, the less powerful, right? Uh, the kind of migration we're seeing today is not really about a more powerful group coming and seizing control of a less powerful group. It is in fact the least powerful people around arriving in a place where people have much more power than them. Um, uh, for me, what's more, what's more uh, interesting than the, than the colonization metaphor, because I don't think that migrants colonize the places they go to. They change the places they go to, but as they should, places will change. Much better to change with a, you know, an expansive sense of equality and decency and, and, and morality than to change denying those sorts of attributes. But, but um, I think we should rather look at it as a bit like adoption. Right? Um, when somebody arrives in your country, for example, it's a little bit like the, the challenge that's being offered. That person brings with them a potential future, right? They come and a future comes with them. It's different kinds of future come with them. Uh, in that sense, they are like an adopted child, right? If in a family a child is adopted and that child is made to feel uh, different, uh, unwelcome, uh, less uh, everything, um, you know, the adoption is likely to result in a, in a horrific uh, circumstance, both for the adopted child and for the family. But we know that it is possible in families for enough love and openness and generosity to be extended for that child to actually become part of that family, to really become part of that family. And the family will be changed by the adoption, but the family will be a bigger, better, more beautiful, more wonderful family. Um, and so I think what we're seeing right now actually is a complete failure to muster the generosity of spirit that we see in successful adoptions towards migrants who want to come. Um, they are asking to belong to a family uh, and they are being told you are unworthy of this family. How is that going to work out? It is not going to work out well. Um, you know, when uh, I'm in Europe, for example, sometimes I'm asked, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, what, tell us how stories can, you know, help de-radicalize, you know, uh, Muslim populations in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, how, how can we find the storytellers who will do this? And I said, look, you know, you need to find the kind of society where someone like you isn't in the position of looking for the storytellers from that community who you will elevate so they can tell the story how everything is equal. Instead, naturally, your society should be producing storytellers like this who can tell their stories uh, so that you don't have to, you know, uh, that, you know examine your own um, tendencies towards racism, repression, um, uh, not thinking of human beings as truly equal. 
because what the migrant brings to any country that is a constitutional democracy um, is a question. And that question is, do you really believe in equality? Um, and generally speaking, the answer that we are hearing is no. And, and the consequences of that answer are severe, right? Uh, so, so either we expand our sense of these things and we answer yes, um, uh, and we don't think, oh, you're here to colonize me. You're not. You're here because you believe the principles that I claim to believe in. Now, I have to ask, answer whether I really do believe in that. And, 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 and I think that that, um, that is something societies can answer. But to answer in that way, someone needs to begin to articulate the optimistic, exciting future that can result from answering that, right? If you can start to say, well, look, you know, it's entirely possible that our kids and grandkids will look a little bit different from us and maybe somewhat more intermixed, um, that, uh, you know, that the San Francisco of 200 years ago is likely to be as different from the San Francisco of 200 years ago as San, Fr as San Francisco is today. Um, you know, that, that uh, places change, but they can change to become more interesting, more beautiful, more fascinating, with better food, better music, a better dating scene, you know. Um, you start to articulate those, those kinds of futures, and then you can move in that direction. The problem is, what we are doing right now, is we're completely failing to articulate what is this better world that becomes possible. And if we collectively fail to do this, which I think as storytellers is part of our jobs, but I think as citizens is part of our jobs, um, if, we, if, we, if we don't begin to articulate what is this better world that could come into existence, then we leave the ground open for the people saying that there is no better world. Let's go back to the world of the past. Let's reinvent that world. Um, and then, you know, they will bring us all down with them. Hi, I oh. had a question about the meaning, meanings or consequences for you of uh, saying goodbye. Um, I was really struck in reading the book at the beginning when Saeed says goodbye to his father. It was shocking to hear you say or the character say that it was like murdering him. <clears throat> But then at the end, uh, and even a little before the end, Saeed and Nadia say Don't goodbye. Don't say what happened in the end, but yes. Oh, <laughs> well, that's okay. Well, the, yeah. there's a different uh, meaning to be and feeling of what the consequences are of saying goodbye. Well, what accounts for that in your thinking? Is it a historical change? Is it a societal change? Is it a literary thing? How, how could you explain it to us? Well, I think that... Um, uh, so the first element of goodbye, you know, in the novel, it's, it's that, you know, when we migrate, we murder from our lives those we leave behind. And I think you know, what that line refers to is, is not that we actually kill these people, um, but there is an emotional violence that occurs when we remove from our day-to-day -day lives people that we love and care about, which every migrant experiences. Uh, and you experience that whether you move from, you know, uh, D.C. to San Francisco or you move from Pakistan to America. Um, I've experienced that many times. And it's the thing that has so many of us wondering, you know, should I go back to that place? Um, should I have these people I care about be part of my daily life again? Um, uh, I think that emotional violence that migration brings, you know, that the, that the migrant experiences towards the people the migrant loves, needs to be acknowledged because it's a wound. Um, and if that wound doesn't get acknowledged, it festers. And it festers across generations. And the sense of, of emotional violence that has occurred is, is sort of brought upon generation and generation and generation where it has echoes. Um, uh, perhaps in violence towards other people, perhaps violence within the family, perhaps um, you know, just violence towards one's own identity, never accepting the new thing that one can become. So I, I think that uh, acknowledging the emotional violence of, of, to oneself as much as to anything else um, uh, that migration involves is very important. But at the same time, when you talk about, you know, what is a goodbye at the end, um, I think that, uh, uh, in a sense, one of, you know, when we think about the notion of, of transience, of letting go of things, you know, uh, as we will each have to let go of everything, um, there are so many ancient wisdoms that one can look to as sources of inspiration of, of how does one deal with this, right? Um, and you know, among those wisdoms, you know, would be, for example, uh, uh, 
you know, a, a Zen Buddhist-like uh, sense that, you know, with, with a focus upon the present moment, we can perceive the future uh, and the past as a kind of illusion uh, and expand our present to such a degree um, and inhabit it so fully that uh, our terror of what is to come and our sense of you know, remorse at what has passed diminish and become you know, manageable for us. Uh, uh, or you can look at, you know, for example, which the novel tries to do, um, the approach, for example, of, of, of Sufism, which is the tradition of Islamic mysticism, which is mirrored in many other traditions like uh, the Jewish existentialism uh, or love-based uh, uh, theology of, of, of uh, Martin Buber, the, you know, the I-Thou relationship. In, in so many traditions, but in the Sufi one, for example, what, what uh, we learn is that love is a way to transcend and that um, if, we, if we love something outside of ourselves, the universe or our children or our beloved, um, uh, the notion that we ourselves will cease isn't the end of everything because what we love may continue. And, um, and that is an antidote, for example, to our horror of transience. And in this novel, uh, in a sense, what, uh, what's being explored is that notion of love. Uh, and and it's, it's worth making clear that that, that kind of uh, the I thou Martin Buber uh, connection or the or the Sufi love uh, isn't the way we often use love today, which is a, a possessive form, right? You know, if I love you, then you are my wife or my girlfriend, or if I love your shoes, I want to have your shoes. Um, you know, it's not that it's not that I love you because you know uh, I want to possess you, or I love you because you make me less lonely. It's the deeper, less possessive sense of the term, which is to say, I love you because I wish you to be less known. Um, and, uh, and that form of the word, that non-possessive uh, 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 nature of it, actually is a faculty that we human beings possess, which does allow us to a certain extent to transcend um, the violence of the first kind of uh, departure that we talked about. And, and it's one of many ways. I mean, I'm not saying this is the way for everyone, but what I'm saying is that in our culture, in our storytelling, in our religion, in our thought, in our philosophy, we homo sapiens have come up with many, many ways to make out of transience still a possibility for hope and optimism and beauty. Um, and it's worth thinking about those things, you know, dusting off the ones that uh, are still useful to us and hopefully presenting them in terms that are not limited to people of one religious or ethnic or racial or whatever tradition, but are open to all uh, or none, uh, and, uh, and having conversations about these things as human beings. And, and so in the novel, in a sense, um, it's, it's those two different approaches, uh, uh, the violence that occurs with the loss, but also ways in which it can be trans transcended uh, that are being explored. All right, and on that note. Well done.